Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Know Before You Go, Scotland's Wild Highlands and Islands. And it will be presented by two of our fabulous NatHab expedition leaders, Warwick Lister Kay and Simon McLaughlin. Guys, thank you so much for being here today. We cannot wait to uh, get prepared and excited for this incredible adventure. Thank you, Sunny. I'm it's, turning uh, right over to you guys. <laughs> great, thank you very much for that introduction, Sunny. It's um, a pleasure to be here and thank you to all of you who have uh, taken the time to log in. We're gonna get straight into it and um, what we're hoping to do is to give a, a relatively quick presentation, giving an overview of the, the Scottish trip, the Scottish NatHab trip, and then to leave plenty of time for questions afterwards. So please um, do uh, type any questions that you may have through to Sunny, and, uh, and then we'll be able to do a nice good Q&A after this brief presentation. So um, my name is Warwick Lister Kay. I'm the, um, the I'm NatHab's ground handler on the ground in Scotland. So I wrote this trip and put it together and I sort of manage the logistics along with my wife. We're a husband and wife team here living in the Highlands. And um, I mentioned my uh, my children, Reuben and Hazel, and um, here they are pictured, that's Reuben on the left, watching a, a skein of Hooper swans flying down the river in front of our house. And, uh, and Hazel in the canoe, you can see with my wife and I. And I'm, the reason I mention them is because we consider all of our nat have guests to be guests of the family when they come to scotland um this is our home and we feel very privileged to live here and we want to um, share our excitement and our love for scotland with you and we will extend to all of our nat have guests an invitation to come to our home for a little evening entertainment um, during the course of the trip. I'm not going to reveal the contents of that because it's a little bit of a surprise, but um, if you come, you will get to meet, um, you'll get certainly get to meet Hazel. Reuben might be in bed by the time you arrive. I have with me Simon McLaughlin, um, who is one of our expedition leaders here in Scotland. This photograph was taken just a week ago in Rocky Mountain National Park, where Simon on the left there, myself in the middle, and one of our other colleagues, Donald Shields, who's another expedition leader, were um, taking part in a fantastic NatHav um, training event. We got to spend several days in this beautiful setting with, I think it was up to 80 NatHav colleagues. And uh, we're just reminded what a, what a superb bunch they are and what a lovely company it is to work for. Simon, do you want to say a little bit about yourself? Oh, thanks, Warwick. Um, yeah, as Warwick says, I'm Simon McLaughlin. Um, I led my first trip last year um, for work in NatHab last year, and this year I'm tripling that to three. So very excited and looking forward to seeing anybody there who's coming on the trip this year, and hopefully if uh, Warwick will have me, I'll continue in future years and meet some more of you. Um, I, in my day job, so this is a, a part-time element to my day-to-day uh, -day life. My day job, I work for a, a wildlife NGO in the Highlands. I've been here for 16 years now, managing uh, nature reserves, blanket bog, and Caledonian pine wood habitats, and continue to do that at the same time. So I hope that gives me some um, qualification to have this privilege to guide you around the highlands and discuss you know many things including conservation um, so thank you for having me here so as i mentioned welcome to our home this is the view from our front door and i'm just going to start off with a few photographs off the top of my my iphone um recent photographs real when people say to me, like friends of mine say, you know, what is it that North Americans come to Scotland with NatHab to see? 
I always find it's a little bit of a difficult question to answer because, you know, unlike so many of NatHub's destinations, we don't have um, gorillas or um, tigers or elephants or, you know, those sort of mega fauna headline species. But I think that what people love about Scotland, and they, they know this in advance, and maybe they, if they don't, they're going to leave knowing this, is that uh, we have absolutely stunning landscapes. Um, from the, the Northwest Highlands, which is rugged and mountainous, to these beautiful uh, convoluted coastlines and the islands that lie off our shores, the Isle of Skye, of course, and the Hebrides. Um, these castles, you know, silhouetted here, this is Elan Donham Castle, which I'll talk about a bit more later on. And the, as, as well as beautiful, rugged, wild landscape in a relatively underpopulated area you know sort of in one sense we are europe's last wilderness area with a population density of less than one person per square mile we also have our famously temperamental weather and the good thing about um, the constantly shifting weather is that we have the constantly shifting light conditions and so there's constantly light and shadow and patterns playing across the landscape and just adding to the sense of mood and romance and beauty um, so these as i say just a few pictures from our local area this is the head of glen strathfire it's about a 20 minute drive from my house um, and just snaps from my iphone i've put in a couple of autumnal shots as well um, because um, we as well as running our summer trips sort of may through july um, we are running a trip in September and a trip in October, which is a, a stunning time of year to come to the Highlands. Um, and here's my daughter, Hazel, age three, learning to ride her bike um, in, again, Glen Strathfara, just five minutes from my, my home and five minutes from where Simon lives as well um, in, uh, in October. So let's just get into some of the, the sort of specifics of what you can expect from a uh, nine day tour around uh, around the highlands and islands. First of all, the hotels. We start off in this magnificent um, Victorian country house, which has been uh, relatively recently converted into a hotel called the Cool House Hotel. It's, it's about half an hour outside Inverness, so it's a rural hotel. It sits within several acres of private land including an arboretum of exotic trees from all over the world you might be surprised to drive up the drive and see a sequoia towering over the uh, the hotel um, it is a family-run hotel run by a couple called stuart and susanna mcpherson who are friends of ours and who you know like us um, have become very fond of nathab over the last seven years that we've been working with um, with nathab and um, we take all of our NatHab groups there and we love this hotel. Um, we start the trip there and what I think is really nice is that we also end the trip there. So having gone out and done our expedition around the Highlands and Islands, we return um, to this place by which point you know, you'll feel like you're coming home. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely hotel, it's highly appointed, excellent amenity. This is the dining room, it's a sort of, um, is that a hexagon or an octagon? Anyway, basically a circular dining room with these lovely bay windows looking out over the gardens. The, the um, menu is superb, really high quality uh, cooking and an excellent chef. And um, they've recently renovated all of the rooms. So um, this is a very bad photograph by me, I'm not sure the, uh, hoteliers would thank me for it, but hopefully you get a sense of the fact that the rooms are really comfortable um, and um, of course all have lovely ensuite bathrooms as well. So it's a fantastic hotel. The other two hotels that we use during the trip are also very good, um, but I would say that we choose them more for their location than um, perhaps for the experience of being inside the hotel. Um, this is the first one. It's called the Clooney Inn. It's a um, 19th century coaching um, inn, old coaching inn. And as you can see, it is just in a stunning location. Um, it has also been recently renovated. It's very cozy, comfortable. 
The food is also good. It's more sort of pub grub than fine dining, but it's it's um, it's good e good eating. But the thing that I love about this hotel is that is this. You know, you step outside the door, and these are the views that are going to greet you. And for those of you who come during the autumn months, um, you may well hear red deer rutting around the hotel throughout the night as well. A little bit of evening entertainment for you. Um, and then the third hotel that we use is called Hotel Hebrides. It's up on the up on the Hebrides, um, the Western Isles. And again, it's a cozy, comfortable um, little village hotel um, with really lovely staff um, in the tradition of um, the warm hospitality of the islands. You'll be met with a smile and um, and, and and really friendly, excellent staff. So nice hotels. During the course of the nine day trip, we do, we spend a fair bit of time on boats. Um, in fact, we do at least five boat trips during nine days. So I'm just gonna talk about the boats quickly and what you can expect, starting from the smallest and working our way up to the largest. So on the, the second to last day, we do a lovely um, two to two and a half hour river boat trip down through the Agus Gorge. And here you can see a group last year receiving their briefing on the riverbank on a beautiful um, summer's day. And um, we have expert river guides, uh, canoe guides who um, are there for our safety. Um, and then once we, we get underway, we head off down into this lovely steep sided gorge called the Agus um, Gorge. And it's pretty much slack water. There's a bit of a, as we, the first half of the trip, we have the current behind us, and then we go into an area that's actually dammed. And for that reason, um, it's almost like being in a, in a lake. Um, so it's very gentle, easy paddling, um, lots of opportunity for taking photographs, um, breathing fresh air, getting a little bit of exercise. And also for wildlife, there is our nesting um, osprey and um, occasionally other raptors as well in this area, but also lots of um, riverside um, birding to be, to be done as we, as we float down the river. Moving up a, a boat, we do a boat trip out into the North Sea um, to specifically to look for bottlenose dolphins. And we'll come back to the dolphins in a minute, but let's just talk about the boats. Um, it's a rigid inflatable, as you can see it here, it's called Sorsa, which is Gallic for freedom. And it's a comfortable rigid inflatable, as you can see each um, passenger has an individual seat. Um, there's something to sort of grip onto in front of you. Um, it's easy to get on and off using this pontoon. Um, and of course your, your expedition leader and the, the skipper will be there to assist you uh, on and off the boat as well. So as rigid inflatables go, it's, it's, it's a great one. Um, of course, you are exposed to the elements. And um, so if it's raining, for example, you know, you are going to get rained on. Now, now we provide you with a head to toe waterproof suit, like a sort of Sywester type thing. Um, <clears throat> we should keep, you know, the vast majority of any um, sea spray or any rain off you. Um, but, you know, as with all things relating to the Highland of Scotland, you do need to be prepared for all weather eventualities. And so layers, uh, warm layers and waterproof um, jackets and pants are important. And even on a fine sunny summer's day, uh, when you go out onto the North Sea and you're, you're traveling at some speed in this quite rapid boat, it can be very cool on the water. So you know, again, I would recommend a woolly hat and gloves as well. Um, once we're out on the, the Hebrides, um, we take a, a five hour boat trip out to the, the Sheant Isles, Sheant Isles that Simon's going to talk about in a moment. And this is the boat that we take out. So it's a, um, a catamaran, it's got two, two um, hulls. Um, as you can see, it's got an open viewing deck at the back and then a relatively sort of large, um, what do you call it, a cabin, cab? Yeah. 
at the front, which, um, and take it from me, you can squeeze 12 people in there if the weather's really poor, we, um, we know from experience. Um, it's quite cozy, you'll get to know each other pretty well, um, but if everyone needs to take shelter, it can be done. It does also have, um, I guess, what in marine terms you would call a head, um, a, a small bathroom there for, um, for comfort purposes. So it's a nice boat to use um, because ideally you're going to be outside on the viewing platform enjoying views of seabirds and potentially cetaceans and just enjoying the view and the sea air. But if need be, you can shelter inside. And then we take two trips on large um, uh, passenger ferries. And this is a hundred car passenger ferry. So it's quite a big ship very well appointed with restaurants and um, lounges and um, as a cafe and a little shop in there. But also, as you can see, it has excellent viewing areas, um, especially towards the stern, um, where you can get out on deck and again, enjoy the views, look for, do some sea watching um, and, and look for, for birds as we're crossing. One of the crossings is about two and a half hours and the other one is about one and a half hours. That's to the Outer Hebrides and back again. Um, they are stabilized, so they're, it's pretty smooth sailing really, even in relatively rough seas. I'm always quite impressed with how, how these boats cope with that. And this is the, um, they're operated by a company called Caledonian McBrain or affectionately known as Calmac in the Highlands. Um, and this is, I think it's called the Lord of the Isles, um, sailing into the, the port of Uig, right in the very north tip, northern tip of Skye. So I mentioned um, the Shiant Isles, and one of the things that we do on our boat trips is that we go out to this um, archipelago. I'm going to put a hand over to Simon, who's going to tell you a bit about its, the reason we go there and, and what you might see there. Um, hi, Simon here. Um, yeah, this this place, the chance is it holds um, quite close to my heart. Uh, in 2014, I made my first voyage to the chance as part of um, my day work, uh, basically monitoring the rat population and other associated birds, invertebrates, and mammals um, on the islands, with the view of um, looking at removing the black rats from the island, which is a, a massive conservation project that was set up in conjunction with Nature Scott, who are the authority in Scotland uh, on um, wildlife conservation. And so in 2014, I was part of the surveying team that went out to these amazing uh, archipelago of islands, uh, three of them in total. Um, I stayed on the island for a couple of months with two other people in a little shed, which hopefully we'll get to see, or a bothy, it's uh, slightly posher than a shed, and spent um, those months monitoring the invertebrates, as I say, but the biggest privilege was monitoring the birds, um, puffin being the, the highlight species, along with, um, here we go, uh, a lovely shot of the puffin here. Um, we've got almost a million um individuals on the chance and uh, so we've got around about 10 percent of the the uk population um and i think the uk hold about 10 percent of the world population so this is quite an important bird um for us to uh work on in in my day job that is and i i take great joy and pleasure i almost got a lump in my throat thinking about it because uh uh, I almost feel like I, I, I left part of me there when I when I lived and worked there. Um, and these birds are, are incredible uh, carnivores, actually. They hunt uh, sand eels uh, and take those back to their wee burrows in, on the island. Um, they make these burrows into this grassy vegetation that you see just below them there. And that's where they uh, rear their young and feed them on sand eels. Um, one funny story I, I will tell you while I was monitoring for these birds is down the burrow, um, I had to, you know, sort of weigh and monitor these young birds as they were developing. So this involved me putting my hand down this burrow, which was about an arm length depth um, to the bottom. 
and uh, nine times out of ten my hand went into one of two places you can probably imagine what one of the places was I think Warwick alluded to um, a place on the boat called the toilet uh, and that's where my hand inevitably went every time uh, so it's a 50-50 chance uh, the second um, attempt I would always get the chick um, which would usually peck my finger at the same time but yeah wonderful wonderful bird wonderful species along with a, a whole range of other species like gannets oh there we go uh, that was a perfect segue there um, these amazing birds one of our largest um, seabirds and as you can see in that shot they are formidable hunters. Um, you've probably seen them, if not in real life, on wildlife documentaries. Um, and what they're doing, uh, which is pretty obvious, I'm sure, is uh, they've got their eyes fixed on a, a, a fish, sorry, and uh, they they plunge to an incredible depth. I don't know what depth they go to. It's yeah, well, they'll plunge, they'll plunge to um, you know six to 12 uh, feet deep, but then they'll actually swim deeper and they can swim to you know significant depths in, in chasing um, fish. Absolutely incredible birds. I think uh, when they're young, there's there's a high risk of them injuring themselves or even fatally um, because of the speed and the impact they hit that water. They have to be like a, a dart when they, they hit that water so that they can carry on on that trajectory. And um, yeah, uh, other birds that, um, or other species should I say, include, well, on the, uh, east side, uh, probably in the first couple of days on our tour, on our first boat trip actually, is uh, we would hope to see some bottlenose dolphins, which we have around about 200 in yeah. population uh, in that area of Scotland. Um, I believe these are the heaviest, largest of the bottlenose dolphins in the world um, due to the the amount of food that's available and also the conditions they have to survive. Um, and these these uh, dolphins grow up to about three meters long, and what is it about 270 kilograms? Is that yeah, at least. I mean, they they are. If you think of your sort of typical flipper like Flor Floridian bottlenose dolphin, these ones that live in the North Sea are twice the body weight of those ones. So they are big, beefy animals, and a lot of that's just blubber because of our northerly latitude. So I don't think one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that our latitude here is 57 degrees north. So we're at the same latitude as Moscow or Churchill um, on the Hudson Bay. So we, you know, we're really far north. And the only reason that we have a relatively, <laughs> relatively um, mild climate here is because of the um, Gulf Stream. Yep. Yep. Can we push on? Yeah. So thank you, Simon. Um, some of the things activities that you can expect other than boat trips well we, we you know we're going to take some walks and um we're going to walk on some beautiful beaches this is luskentire beach which was voted one of the top 10 um beaches in the world recently and it not only is it a stunning huge beach out on the west uh, out on the um the western isles out on the hebrides but it's also uh relatively unvisited so you know uh, it would be not uncommon for us to go there and find that we're sharing it with just 10 other people, for example. Um, so it's a, it's a beautiful place to go and stretch the legs. And um, uh, right along the uh, western seaboard of the Hebrides, there is this unique habitat that's called Macha, another good Gallic word. Um, Macha is um, a really rare coastal um, meadow habitat. Um, which has been created when uh, seashells have been smashed by coastal action and thrown up onto the sh um, the sand dunes by um, by by storm action, thereby creating a very calcium-rich, sandy, free-draining soil on which um, grow this extraordinary mix of wildflowers, um, and that's known as the maca. And you can see. It's also typified by these white sandy beaches and this sort of beautiful, almost tropical looking uh, waters behind them. Do you want to mention, say a word or two about otters? Um, you might have to help me a little bit. Okay. But, um, yeah, uh, one of the species that we would hope to um, see is this uh, incredible creature. Um, 
we do talk a little bit about uh, one of our um, local um, heroes, I suppose you would call him, mm -hmm. uh, Gavin Maxwell. You may have heard of him. He wrote the, he was the author of uh, Bring Up Bright, Bright Water, and we'll be passing through that part of the world on the way to Sky. Um, we'll be talking a bit about uh, Gavin, Gavin Maxwell at various points on the trip. Um, this is a, a mammal that we would hope to see. We can never guarantee it. Um, but if uh, you know if it's quite stormy sometimes, looking in these sheltered pools, um, we will get to see these these otter. Um, this one I'm guessing is a sea otter, um, which is the same species as your um, inland otter. That's right, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, these species are still closely tied and linked to to the mainland. They can only go so far. Um, otters have been reported on the shants in the past. I would say that's probably at their limit. Correct me if I'm wrong there, work because um, they do need fresh water to survive. Um, they're not marine animals really, um, so they're very much tied to to that. But they're very much at home in the sea. Um, we spend a lot of time in the sea looking for wildlife, talking about the cultural history as well. Um, so this is this is one we would hope to see. Um, and if we're lucky enough, we may see one either hunting or even better feeding on crabs or any of the sort of mollusks that uh, it may hunt or scavenge uh, along the shoreline um yeah that's right so this is the, um it's called the eurasian otter it's lutra lutra so it's not strictly speaking a sea otter but as, as simon says they have adapted to spend um, large percentages of their life at sea or on the coast anyway um we we like to try and get you out. You know, I really sort of passionately feel that we do not want to be running a minibus tour. I mean, this is not a coach tour of the Highlands. Uh, we want to get you out, breathing fresh air, striding about, um, enjoying um, our beautiful scenery. And so we'll take walks um, to get you in amongst the hills. Um, and um, you know, there, there are some fantastic view, some fantastic views to be enjoyed. This is a view of the coolins of sky this is a an old an ancient volcanic landscapes so actually um the sort of roots of a, a of an ancient volcano um that created this really dramatic um stark and sometimes quite dark and brooding mountain landscape that plunges down to the sea on the southern um, end of the isle of sky just as an example um we we're oh. going to see golden eagles back to you Simon. handing over to me i do quite a lot of work on eagles in the area well both warwick and i i mean we, we live in amongst eagles here uh this is golden eagles as you can see from the the, the heading there um so there's always chances of seeing these birds on your trip especially um as we get into the summer and the chicks are growing fast the two adults um male female will be actively hunting to feed the young on whether it's ptarmigan or mountain hare uh, which is fairly abundant in the hills and maybe the odd um, carcass left from whether it's from lambing or even a calf a deer, red deer calf um, so i mean the population of these is pretty sort of stable and healthy in the highlands um, I, I work uh, quite closely with colleagues on reintroduction programs with these birds, trying to repopulate areas um, in southern parts of Scotland where numbers are still pretty low. Um, persecution has been an issue for these birds in the past, but thankfully that seems to be um, reducing now and uh, these birds are being safely reintroduced to these areas. Um, and then we've got an even bigger eagle, a uh, reintroduction species uh, brought from Norway in the 1970s. Um, I think the first birds were reintroduced to Mull. So out on the Western Isles, these birds have increased incredibly in numbers. They've been very successful. So successful, sometimes there's a little bit of controversy and conflict with the crofters. Um, uh, as they are such big birds, they do take big prey and can take and do take um, large mammals, whether they be domestic lambs. Quite often they're dead um, lambs, um, but they do prefer fish and quite often um, some of the, the fishing boats and some of the organized trips will uh, throw fish out for these birds. 
let's encourage them in. Um, so the population of those on the islands that we'll be going to, so Sky, we're probably looking at about 20 to 25 pairs on Sky, and similar numbers on Lewis, and similar numbers, funnily enough, on uh, on the US islands just south of Lewis. So there's a very good chance we'll see these boats during May and June. Always a red letter day when you see a golden eagle, in my opinion. But the sea eagles are amazing too. They're so big, the fourth fourth largest eagle in the world quite closely related to um, your bald eagles. No, I'm conscious of the time, so we're just gonna rattle on a little bit. Um, when we're out and about walking over through the lochs, um, we have a good chance of seeing what you would call Arctic loons, what we call black-throated divers, and their smaller, daintier cousins, um, red-throated divers. Just stunning birds, um, typically the red-throated divers um, breed on the smaller hill lochens, the lochen as we would call it, which is just a small loch, um, whereas the black throated tigers tend to dominate the larger bodies of water. But just an example of some of the beautiful wildlife that we have around the highlands. And you're going to see plenty of red deer. Um, we have a lot of red deer in, in, in the highlands. Um, I mean, there are lots of different conservation stories to be told while we travel around and, and you know we will do that um, and you know just as it is in the United States um, the pop deer population is a, a bit of a problem in some places but um, regardless of that they're still wonderful to watch and they might be you know silhouetted sort of moodily on a on a distant um, horizon just as in this case or uh, watch out because they might just be over your shoulder in a field right behind you, sort of presenting good photo opportunities. So the magnificent red deer stags here in full antler, um, ready to take on their arrivals during the rut. Um, do you want to say a word or two about boxes, Simon? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think this is a, a bit of a pirate bird. Um, if you haven't heard about the bonxies or the great skewers, it's um, uh, nationally known. Um, Bonxie is um, it's a, it's a North Island um, local name. So or Orcadians, people from Orkney and Shetland call them Bonxies. Um, I'll have to do a little bit of research on where that word came from because uh, I do not know. But what I can tell you is, is we hold a massive proportion of the population, uh, the world population of these pirate birds. I call them pirate birds because they are a bit lazy when it comes to finding food. They'll just chase terns and uh, gannets, uh, and they'll just hound them until they release their food, and then they are expert in the flight. Um, and it's incredible to watch them as they drop their catch. These uh, bonxies will catch it in midair quite um, perfectly. Um, and I mentioned before about the population of these birds, there's about 56% of the world population, believe it or not, all around the UK, um, which is, you know, if the, the numbers go down, that's a global issue rather than just a local issue, but quite incredible birds and quite charismatic to, to see as well. So They're also um, aggressive defenders of their nest sites, and so if you get um, you can be walking in a, you know, an island location, and if you get too unwittingly get too close to a nest site, then you can, you can have this kind of view. <laughs> That's why I've lost all my hair. <laughs> um, of course, Scotland is globally famous for its beautiful castles, and this is Elan Donnan Castle, one of one of the most. It's said to be the one of the most photographed castles in the world and um, certainly adorns um, plenty of chocolate boxes, as, and you can see why. Um, there's been a, a fortification of one form or other on this little island um, uh, promontory for a thousand years, but actual, in actual fact, this latest iteration is relatively recent. It was built, um, rebuilt um, in the 1930s. So, um, you know, as castles go, it's quite a, quite a baby, um, but it's um, stunning nonetheless, and one that we'll pass a number of times, so we'll have several opportunities to photograph it. Um, even older, significantly older, are the Callanish Standing Stones, dating back about four and a half thousand years. That makes them only 
slightly junior to the Great Pyramids of Giza. Um, there is archaeological evidence that this site was in continuous occupation for over one and a half thousand years, and they actually built numerous um, um, sets of standing stones um, during that period. Um, we don't know exactly their purpose. There are, of course, many theories, some of them serious and academic, um, some of them more outlandish, if you get the pun. <laughs> um, you, we'll talk about them in depth, but regardless of what you think um, their purpose is, there's, there's no denying their presence. And when you go and walk amongst them and stand next to them, put your hands on them, it's really a very special experience. Of course, at the heart of everything that NatHab does is conservation, and we're very proud to support a, um, a local conservation charity called Trees for Life, who are leading the, um, the movement of trying to rewild the highlands. And um, uh, we'll take you there where you meet the staff. In fact, Simon himself has worked for Trees for Life and, and still does uh, on occasion. Um, and you might even get to hug a, a 500 year old oak tree as this group did. So this tree um, was a seedling when Columbus was um, sailing the seas. Of course, you'll want to meet the locals. Um, they may be of a hairy ginger variety like this, um, or they may be um, of a more, um, or, or even um, a smaller, fluffier variety. Here's um, Tonya from the NatHab office. Um, who came in May meeting one of our, our lovely lambs. Um, and then after the sun sets, um, which because of our northerly latitude in the middle of summer um, is around about 11 p.m. and then we'll be followed by about two hours of darkness before the sun rises again. Um, we might well seek out some traditional entertainment and you know, the, Scotland's cultural um, influence around the world is obviously um, extremely well known and well recognised and many people want to um, hear the bagpipes, hear fiddle music, listen to Gaelic, hear Gaelic spoken, uh, hear Gaelic poetry. Um, and, you know, uh, of course, a lot of North Americans trace their ancestry back to the Highlands and, and that's something that we um, like to talk about while you're here. And you may even indulge in a little of the, the water of life, our famous um, Scotch whiskey. So what about the weather? Well, it's changeable and famously so in the Highlands. Um, as this photograph illustrates, it can be sunny on the right hand side of the photograph and a, and a pretty um, dark foreboding storm approaching from the left hand side of the photograph and and that's the way it is you could have four seasons in one day you might get lucky and have a run of really gorgeous beautiful blue skies and it, you know at the same time it can happen that we can have several days in a ray in a row of rain so the key is to be uh, prepared and that have provide all of our guests with a very comprehensive um, packing list as well as all the other preparatory information that they receive. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned before, plenty of layers, full waterproofs, a, a, a good hat, and uh, and then you'll be prepared for anything. So it might be like this one day, but then the next day, here's Hazel with her NatHab cap on, um, paddling in the river in front of our in front of our house. So if you fancy a paddle or a swim, then bring your um, your swimming costume. I just want to say a word about seasonality too. We run the trips through three seasons, um, spring, um, summer and autumn. Uh, each of them is equally fantastic. Um, I love um, the autumn, I love the spring, and of course um, the summer is wonderful for its um, generally better weather and those amazing long days that we have. So I'm not going to say that one is better than the other. But it is important to recognize that after the summer season ends, the seabird colonies empty out, all those birds and their young fly back out to sea uh, where they'll spend the rest of the year. 
So the boat trips that we do for the seabirds, we adapt in the autumn and we go out and we do a more sort of landscape cultural style boat trip, looking at some incredible ancient um, geological forms and some um, ruined um, old ancient villages up the coast of Harris, as well as looking for cetaceans and, um, and white-tailed eagles or sea eagles, etc. cetera. Um, the weather, um, you know, in the autumn can be more inclement, but we can similarly get, you know, periods of high pressure in the autumn, which just bring beautiful days with them. So again, it's hard to say um, really when the weather's better. Um, I would say choose the time that suits you and come then because you're going to have a great time either way. So that concludes our, our little presentation. I have kind of rattled through that. I wanted to leave 15 minutes for questions. Thank you so much for that presentation. It was fabulous. And we've got lots of questions, so let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, the first one is, um, there's several questions about the physicality of the trip. So let's start with canoeing. Right. If someone has never canoed before, is this trip going to be an option? Will there be instruction? Will it be very difficult? Yeah. Okay, good question, and thank you for raising it. Um, the answer is, if you have never canoed before, you need not worry. Um, the, the canoe trip is about two hours long. It is in a very mature and gentle stretch of river. So we have two very short passages of slightly faster water. Um, and then apart from that, the whole trip is in really kind of gentle, basically um, sort of meandering, mature river. So, you know, you can put, you can dock your, your paddle, pick up your camera, take photographs. We'll also pull over onto the shore, onto little sandy beaches and things a couple of times during the trip for comfort breaks and for leg stretches and for photographs and for a, um, a picnic lunch, for example. We are accompanied by at least two um, professional canoe guides as well as your expedition leader and both Simon and Donald are extremely proficient paddlers as, as am I and I, I'll often come and um, accompany the group as well. So there's really nothing to be worried about. Um, in the event that we have a windy day, what we tend to do is we'll tie the, the canoes together, we raft them up so that they become like a very stable raft. Um, and then the people on the sort of outside of that raft paddle and everyone else just gets a free ride. So, um, yeah, it's it's perfectly appropriate for people who've never paddled before. And of course, everybody has um, uh, uh, flotation devices or um, life jackets. Sounds good. Um, does each canoe generally have a guide? or will there be travelers alone? No, so the, each canoe has two people in it. And typically the guides actually like to um, be in a canoe on their own so that they've got maximum um, maneuverability in the event of a capsize, for example, which you know, in seven years, touch wood has never happened. Um, so no, um, you won't have a guide. Uh, in your canoe, but we've had several people over the years who have not canoed before, and with a little bit of instruction, a little bit of assistance, they've managed to get the hang of getting the canoe pointing in the right direction very quickly. The only problem we have occasionally is when you get a husband and wife team, you know, there can be a little bit of disagreement <laughs> about who's steering, who's providing the power. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, but no, it's, it's 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 not it's not it's not intended to be a sort of physical um, or technical challenge. It is intended to be an enjoyable float uh, down a beautiful river system and an opportunity to, as I say, breathe fresh air on the last day of the trip and do a little bit of exercise and and enjoy the wonderful. And particularly bird life that we have either side of the river and crossing the river. Mm. So 
assuming that we don't capsize, is being swim is, is being able to swim necessary on this trip? Will there be opportunities to I mean, swim or um is that just an optional thing? Yeah, no, there's no requirement to be to be a swimmer. Um there may be opportunities to swim. Um, you know, if it's a beautiful day and um, we find ourselves beside a loch or on a beach, then by all means, um, you're very welcome to strip off and, and dive in. And we're very fortunate in the Highlands of Scotland that we have no uh, law of trespass. They have this amazing thing that we call the right to roam, which means that we can go anywhere we like on foot. This is a non-vehicular access um, rights. So you can ride a bike, ride a horse, take a canoe, um, walk, camp, anywhere with some, except, some obvious exceptions. Um, so yeah, if there's a, you know, if you want to swim in a river or, or, a, or a loch, you can. At the same time, you don't need to be able to swim. Um, if you, in the event of a capsize from the canoe, you're going to be wearing a flotation device that's going to hold your head above water um, for the few short seconds it's going to take one of the um, canoe guides to get to you and, and, and assist you. Okay. Um, moving on to walking or hiking, can you um, tell us what this trip is characterized as like a moderate or mild um, trip as far as hiking goes or any any other you know information that you can give our viewers as far as how fit they should be to participate in this trip yep. <clears throat> sure thing so the the trip is um, graded or ranked as a moderate trip and not have suggest or recommend that you should be able to walk at least two miles unassisted. Um, the reality is that we're unlikely to walk that far, but some of the terrain that we cover is um, either quite steep uphill or downhill and on you know quite um, uneven, sometimes a bit rocky footpaths. So you, I would say rather than requiring, you know, enormous amount of strength and endurance, um, what is important is, is agility, a degree of agility, a degree of maneuverability over uneven ground, um, the ability to walk uphill for short periods of time and conversely downhill. Um, and also, you know, a degree of agility is required for getting in and out of rigid inflatables or canoes and, you know, of course, the bus and things like that. So, um, yeah, so a mo moderately um, physically demanding trip um, with a, you know, if you can walk two miles, you can do this trip. Great. Um if one of the guests chooses not to take a particular boat trip, are there alternative activities? Well, we will always try to accommodate um, accommodate that. And of course, you know, it does happen. Sometimes we get guests who maybe aren't feeling 100% that day, or we've got guests who, um, you know, get motion sickness on boats or um, they just don't fancy canoeing. So where it is within our, our ability, we will arrange some sort of alternative. And that might be that they go with the bus driver, you know, for a short scenic drive, for example, or they go to a local village or, or tea room or something like that. Um, we can't, you know, guarantee that. Um, because sometimes local conditions just and, and our and our remoteness um, mean that we can't. And usually, what we find is that if guests don't want to do a walk, they're happy to sit on the bus and read, or you know, if it's a beautiful day, just spend some time pottering about in the local vicinity to the bus, do some bird watching, you know, chat to the bus driver, those sorts of things. 
but um, you know there have been occasions where we've we've arranged for them to go and do some something else locally, but we don't make specific allowance for that. We generally expect people to to take part in the activities as planned. As, hopefully that answers the question. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for the clarification. Um, um, are there any extension options for this trip? Or things that you would recommend as far as to lengthen the, the stay in Scotland? Well, <clears throat> I would definitely recommend getting here a day early for a variety of reasons. Um, one, because the Cool House Hotel is such a nice hotel that an extra extra night there is um, is not wasted. Trust me on that. Um, two, you know, in the post-COVID world, the um, the airlines and the airports are still not firing 100% on all cylinders. Now, I've done quite a lot of personal travel over the last year or so, and it's getting much, much better. The incidence of delayed flights and cancelled flights and lost luggage, which were a real problem immediately after COVID, is now very low. But nevertheless, it makes sense to just give yourself an extra 24 hours travel time, time for lost luggage to catch up with you, that sort of thing. And of course, because of the, the jet lag problem as well, um, you know, you're going to start the trip just that much fresher and more rested if you've arrived 24 hours earlier. So I would definitely recommend taking the pre-night option. In terms of a, an organized extension, there is not one at the moment. Um, we used to do one to the Orkney Isles um, several years ago, but that's um, we haven't done that for a while. One thing I will say is that um, my, my wife and I, who run this little travel company, um, and we have a number of different clients, including NetHub, are happy to ar arrange group extensions. So if you've got you know four or five, six people, a little family group or a group of friends who want to go on and do you know three, four, five days doing something else in the Highlands or the Islands, then we'll be, we'll be very happy to arrange that for you on a sort of private basis. And in fact, um, Simon um, led a couple of little private group extensions for us last year with great success. Is it worth mentioning? Great, about that sounds the... wonderful. Sorry, Sonny. Yes, that's a very good point. Yeah, thank you. Simon's just made a very good point there, which is that the Cotswolds trip, which you'll also find on the website and in the, bro and in the brochure, the catalogue, um, which is in England, in a beautiful rural part of England, um, can make quite a nice um, pre-trip to the Highlands. And last year, a number of our guests did the Cotswolds, and then they spent a couple of days, for example, in Edinburgh, just doing their own thing. And then they came to join the, 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 the Highlands, an Highlands trip. And I believe that from 2024, the departures are going to be arranged in such a way that the Cotswolds trip backs straight on to the Scotland trip. So it won't be the case this year, but from 2024, you could you could do the two with you know um, one one adjoining the other. Good point. Mm, that sounds like a great option. Yeah, very um, different. But two very very so different. Um, sort of exposures to the United Kingdom, but both very beautiful. Oh, yes. Um, would you recommend this trip for a solo traveler? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have lots of solo, solo travelers doing it. Um, we have a you know, maximum group size of 12 people, so it's always a small, um, friendly um, little, uh, group and we always try to sort of engender you know a sense of fun and um, camaraderie and um, you know you might enjoy a little bit of whiskey tasting uh, with one another so um, we've always found that our solo travelers um, have thoroughly enjoyed 
the trip and I can't think of any reason why it wouldn't suit a solo traveler. Okay. Um, this is a very important one. Will there be an opportunity to wear a kilt? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the more the more whiskey you drink, the, the greater the opportunity gets. <laughs> <You'll> just... <laughs> um, absolutely. I mean, bring your own kilt if you've got one. If not, there are various shops along the way that will sell you one. Um, Donald, the other expedition leader that you saw a photograph at the beginning, he um, he will certainly wear a kilt at, at least one point during the during the course of the trip. Um, he's a native Gaelic speaker um, and a proud um, descendant of a, of a family that lives on the Isle of Skye. Um, so, um, and uh, yeah, so we, 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 you know, we're very proud of our cultural heritage. And we also recognize that um, it is globally recognized, you know, it's globally recognized and um and somewhat revered so you know we'll we'll certainly talk about uh gallic culture uh including the garments and the um poetry and the songs and the music and the whiskey and um everything else Excellent. Well, that's the last question we have time for today. So I will hand it back to you for closing comments. Great. Well, look, thank you all. Um, it's been lovely to talk about this beautiful land that we live in and the wonderful wildlife that we're lucky to share it with. Um, I know I speak on behalf of Simon and myself and my wife Becky, and um, when we say it's a privilege to show um, our NatHab guests around the Highlands and Islands. And we're very much looking forward to the arrival of our first group in May. We hope to see you soon. Thanks. Thank you so much for, for bringing us to your home. And I'm very jealous of the folks who will actually get to set foot um, on the Islands and Highlands with you this summer and, and in the future. Hopefully I'll get to get back there one day. I also wanna thank everybody who tuned in. Please join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.